Uh, today's Hebrew Bible readings are from the book of Ruth, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. It is the first one. It's Ruth and Boaz at the threshing floor. Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I need to seek some security for you so that it may be well with you. Now here's our kinsman Boaz, with whose young women you have been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now wash and anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. She said to her, All that you tell me, I will do. The second Ruth story is uh, gives us uh, is chapter four verses thirteen through seventeen, and gives us the genealogy of David. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, "Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may His name be renowned in Israel." He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse and the father of David. And I'm sure... Lord will untangle all that for us. Our New Testament reading is from Mark. Uh, as Penny said, there are two stories. The first is Mark 12, verses 38 to 44. You've heard this one before. Jesus denounces the scribes. As he taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at the banquets. They devour widows' houses, and for the sake of appearance, say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And the second is a widow's offering. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor woman has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But out of her poverty, she has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Let's end of the reading. Words spelled out in the center. 
And it turned out this penny was from the year 1918. The oldest I've ever seen still in circulation. And I was glad it was left behind. Because I love running across those old pennies. Especially coins from such a significant period in time. Because you get to hold it in your hand, just like people did then. People whose days at the time were surrounded by talk of the First World War. The Titanic had only just sunk four years before that. I find it fascinating to think of what people were experiencing when they held these small things in their hands and in their pockets. As you hold the same coin in your own in modern times with modern worries and joys of your own. It's just small, but such a beautiful and amazing thing so many people just toss to the side. And all of this is to the side of the fact of all of the funding people neglect in the disposal. Right? Wow. Have you ever done the opposite? Just pull all your pennies, put them in a big, large jar over the years, they're so small and seem insignificant, but they build up pretty fast if you keep them as you go. All of these tiny things coming together to make a significant sum. Each of these smaller things coming together to make something larger. Something you can do something with. I remember a couple years ago, there's this story of this guy who decided every day he would pick up whatever pennies he found on the road and have those pennies remind him to say thanks to God for the things he had. And he kept them. You guys remember this story? It was pretty big. It added up to over $5,000. By the time he accumulated these things, he needed major dental work, and his whole face was able to be changed for the better as a result of saving all of these coins. They add up to a greater gain you would have otherwise lived without. And that's what our reading is about today. The story of Ruth. Such a small piece of the biblical canon. Only four chapters long. But it really makes an impact. And this short book is actually one of my favorites. Out of all those larger stacks of paper, we tend to pay more attention to as we go. So, Frank just read a few pieces from this already brief story. I'm not sure how many of you guys recall the story of Ruth, but either way, a refresher always helps. So I'll just do a quick re recap so we can share these moments in their fullness and remember. The main people in this story are Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz. Ruth, a Moabite, not an Israelite, married one of Naomi's sons. Another woman married Naomi's other. Both of Naomi's sons wound up dying before either conceived a child. Naomi's husband is also dead, and she's alone, struggling. And Naomi tells the two women, go, 
Find a way to move on and be fruitful. Leave me behind for your own sakes. A moment of giving just a little bit of good. Whatever there was to offer. To these two women traveling at her side. One of the women pretty much immediately says, All right, see ya. <laughs> and she's off on her way. But Ruth says she knows that Naomi is struggling to survive. A woman alone in the ancient world, a world not too kind to childless widows say the least. And she tells Naomi, no! Actually, let me just read straight from the book, because these words, though only very short, are awesome and powerful. From the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. But Ruth said, do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. In just a short moment, giving of such a tremendous good. And so Ruth stays with Naomi. And Naomi struggles. And Naomi's struggles become Ruth's struggles. And so from this point on, Naomi is determined to give whatever good she can give back to Ruth even in the smallest of ways. And just to more quickly sum up all that goes on, a whole bunch of tiny moments of blessing are exchanged between Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. Ruth goes out to glean the fields owned by Boaz. And this means basically standing behind the reapers and gathering up the small bits left behind in the greater gathering, picking up the scraps. And she did this so persistently, she wound up gathering a great deal. Boaz notices her. It knows all of the good she has done for Naomi. And in knowing about all of these things, he saw they added up to such a tremendous kindness. And he winds up giving her even more from the fields as a result. Through all of this, Boaz winds up actually wanting to take Naomi as his wife, and he himself offers these tiny moments of goodwill to the next of kin, who more rightly could take her as his own. And this, too, is paid back to him 100-fold. Because as a result, he winds up very safely and without conflict, being able to take Ruth as his wife. And from there, all these smaller minutes piling, piling, until Ruth and Boaz, together as husband and wife, wind up giving birth to a son together. And this son of theirs, through this story of giving, just a piece at a time, these moments of offering between struggling souls winds up becoming the father 
of Jesse, who was himself the father of David. From this short little story in the middle of all of these larger stacks of pages comes the house of the greatest king Israel has ever known. And from this same house, all of those pages later, came the life of Christ himself. It just amazes me. But at the same time, I'm not surprised. Because isn't this so often the way we felt God, life, move through us and in us ourselves. Through these tiny moments, the seemingly smallest moments of our lives, creating something big and beautiful to behold. And I think the lesson on these pages and on the unwritten pages of our own lives is important for us to keep as a seed deep down in the center of our souls each day we wake up. Because so often we just dismiss the small stuff we do when we are with others. These tiny moments of good we exchange with the people around us. We tend to forget them or toss them to the side when we think of our lives in total. Just like we do with the pennies from our pockets or the bottom of the purse. But over time, they all add up to something much larger than we ever imagined they could be. Over time, we find that these smaller moments of giving of ourselves for the sake of others, like Barb mentioned, the hug we give to someone in pain, the short conversations we share across couch cushions, the smile we offer a struggling stranger. The three towels we gather from the closets to donate to the homeless shelter. All of these brief moments together wind up being the sum total of all our lives will ever be. Each of the moments we share ourselves in joy and struggle, all of them small on their own, together being the total worth of our work in the world. So as we move along through this new year, Seeing all the negative stuff surrounding. Considering these ways we give of ourselves from the soul to the life around us, adding to the positive. Let's remember to pay close attention to each minute that passes between us and the faces before our eyes. Let's remember the incredible value of each of those minutes and small exchanges as we go. And let's open ourselves wide through every short second to share the love God seated in our hearts to grow into something whole and holy, something big. 